Hi, everybody. Hi. It's, Hi. it's my pleasure to be here to speak to you today. Um, I am kind of sorry that you have to listen to me, but we're, we're going to try to clarify some things about beekeeping. I have been a beekeeper for about eight years. Unfortunately, I lost my last hive uh, this year, this last spring, which just brings to, I'm sure you're aware of the, um, the loss in the bees, or, or in the imported bees. Now, all bees, all the honey bees as we see it, or as we're knowledgeable about, were imported from um, Europe. They came with the colonists. So the honey bee is not native to the North American continent. So uh, we do have other bees uh, in this in North America. They're native bees. We have mason bees. We have bumblebees. A lot of those collect pollen and nectar. Uh, they don't make honey, but they do pollinate. So when you hear that, that we're in danger of losing all the pollinators, no, we are not. The thing that's affecting the bees the most right this minute is colony collapse. Um, there's also diseases. Some are saying that the colony collapse is a result of a combination of diseases and pests that are affecting the beehives. That may be the case. Nobody's absolutely certain what colony collapse is, is caused by. Colony collapse is when you go out to your beehive and you open it up and last week it was vigorous and full, full of bees, full of honey, full of larvae, full of eggs. And this week there's nothing left. It just disappears. So, on that note, let's get started. First of all, in Rutherford County, you can join, attend, learn from beekeeping organizations that exist in place. Rutherford County, I'm not going to say they have the best beekeeping association in the state of Tennessee, but the beekeeper who's the head, the president of the organization, has been voted the best beekeeper in the state of T Tennessee several times. So if you're looking for information, there is no better source than beekeepers associations. Now, if you choose not to go to Rutherford County for beekeeping association for one reason or another, all the counties either combine together several counties to have a beekeeping association or they have a beekeeping association of their own. You say the, the uh, time when they meet is inconvenient to you. There's a beekeeping association that meets at Cheekwood on Sundays. There's a bee, our beekeeping association in this, in this Rutherford County is going to meet today at 7 o'clock at the John Rice, on John Rice Boulevard at the Ag Center in the front building. It's a wonderful group. You don't have to pay to come listen to them. If you choose to join, it's 10 whole dollars for a year. Uh, the education that you receive is magnificent. Great bunch of people. Please, I mean, you're all welcome. So the first Monday of every month. First Monday of every month. Um, Lane Agri-Park, Rutherford Bee Club at gmail.com, and if you choose to become a beekeeper, the Rutherford County Beekeeping Association gives away um, three grants, which includes the beekeeping equipment that you'll need as a startup. It's not a huge amount, but it's, beekeeping's expensive, so it's a significant amount. Um, and um, they will provide you with a mentor to help you along the way. Every beekeeping association in the state of Tennessee provides a three-day class to introduce you. The cost is minimal, it's like $45. It's he usually held in March, but that could vary. Just check with the local beekeeping association that you choose to attend their classes. The state of Tennessee has a bee master program. I have not attended, I do not know anyone that has attended. Um, usually it's in uh, Knoxville at, the, at UT. Why beekeeping? It's important to the worldwide agricultural production. Um, it's estimated that we'd lose at least 30% of all of our crops that are pollinated by bees without bees to pollinate them. Now again, remember, there are native pollinators. But if we lose all the honeybees, we're still going to suffer the lack of the bee. Um, the economic value of honey wax and other hive products. But the primary economic uh, benefit of the honeybee in this area is pollination. As a matter of fact, if, if it weren't for the honeybee, there would be no almonds. The entire California almond crop is pollinated and produces almonds based on the fact that they bring in truckloads, tractor trailer truckloads of beehives. They bring them into Northern California and they park them. And those bees go out and pollinate those flowers for two or three weeks. 
And then when they're done, they pack up and ship off to another location that needs pollinating. Um, is beekeeping for you? It's not hard. Not hard at all. And it's not scary. <laughs> <laughs> Start small. Two colonies for an inexperienced person to keep for one or two years. It's not a big deal. You can do it. Expand as your experience and confidence grow. Read, 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 read. There's tons of information, and it's good information. Ask questions, and uh, Extension will help you, too. Extension has a... Whenever you go on the Internet and you're looking for information, if you type in the last three letters on your, on your, your little search thing, and it's .edu, you'll pull up an education or Extension education document. It's not going to be somebody that's trying to sell something. .edu means that you're going to get an educational um, document from Extension based on science. I don't know how much many of you are familiar with the uh, Master Gardener program, but okay, but the Master Gardener program is a result of the cooperation between the education uh, land grant colleges and um, the government where they're obligated to provide education to the public. If you're a Master Gardener, you are obligated to provide science-based education to the public. Plan ahead. Order your bees, hives, and tools in the fall. If you're planning on having bees next year, you should be ordering your stuff right now. Um, bees will be delivered in the spring, typically in March or April, depending on how soon you get on the list. The bees that they're selling for next year are, will already have started to be obligated. Typically, you should have ordered in October. Uh, there is a, a local uh, apiary that sells bees and when I say local it's within three hour drive it's in uh, Clarks, Clarksville, Clarkston, Kentucky it's two and a half hours away you just drive up get your bees drive back home um, you can get them in the mail there's two ways to get bees in the mail or, well no there's one way to get bees in the mail they come in a box about this big there's three thousand bees in there they have a queen in the middle She's in her own little cage. Um, you take the box, you pry the lid off of it, you spray it down with sugar water, and you have a prepared hive with frames in it. This is a frame. And you dump the bees in there just like that. Did you see that hand motion? It was quick. You dump the bees in there. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then you take the queen in her little box, and you put her between two frames in her box. Don't take her out of her box. Three days after they have grown completely used to that queen and very attached to her because of the chemical pheromones that she's releasing, they're not going anywhere without their queen. You take the queen and you make a little hole in the top. It's a candy. It's a nougat that she's eating from that side. She has two or three attendants and they're eating it too. You make a little hole and then um, so she can work her way out. Once she gets out, uh, she's a mated queen, so she'll start laying the eggs right away. Now, the difference between a mated queen and a virgin queen is one is mated, the other one has not. Um, a mated queen will, can lay, I don't know the exact number, but I know it's over 1,500 eggs a day. She only mates once in her life. After she's born, within two, immediately she flies. She mates with drones that are flying around looking for a queen. Then she comes back and she takes up residence with her her hive and that's the end of it. She only mates once. So does the drone because after he mates he dies. So, so you said she lays 1,500 a day. A day. So within how long does a queen live usually? She'll last she, She'll last three to four years. Um, if she starts to lag in vigor, the hive will replace her. It's a collective kind of consciousness. Th these so is she constantly reproducing during she, all this? Yes. She is, that's all she does is lay eggs and eat. But she, that's all she does. The rest of the bees take care of her. They, that's their job. The, the, nesting, the, the bees that are the attendants in here, their job is to take care of her. That's it. And she lays eggs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twen
two, three, four. <laughs> Yeah, and she lays she lays little bitty eggs, and they're down in the bottom of these uh, spaces. Yeah, so and and the egg is the period of being an egg is three days. If the hive wants a new queen, the difference between a regular female bee and the queen female bee is the quality of the food that they receive between the zero day and the three day. Mark, at three days old, she cannot be changed into a queen after three days old. But from zero to three, if that hive wants a new queen, they'll feed her a food called royal jelly, which is actually higher concentrations of proteins. They'll, it's still got sugars in it, but that will make her a bigger bee. That will extend the nesting or the, the enclosure that she's going to live in. That will extend it out. And uh, they'll, once the new queen is born, she will either, well, first she'll mate, but she will either take half of the hive and go someplace else to live, or she will kill the old queen. But the new queen will... Yeah, it's not a democratic process. Nobody gets elected. <laughs> There's no retirement in the queen in the bee world. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If you have five queens hatching, because a lot of times instead of doing, oh yeah, we need a new queen, we'll just make one. There's five queen uh, spaces, and the first one out will go around and kill all the other ones. And they make a little noise too when they come out. It's a e. You can hear it. Can they move them? Yes, you can. If you know that that's going on, you can take bees from one hive, put it. Put put the queen, your little queen thing, and put it her and the other bees in another hive. There are ways to make new hives out of that hive with that with a new queen, or five new ones. But I don't know. the The health of your hive is based on how many bees are alive in there. And then, does the queen just mate within the hive, or does she? No, go she to goes on a mating flight. She has to go fly. Typically, between one and two miles, she will fly, and she'll and there'll be drones that are looking for a queen. Mm -hmm. Now, drones are males, queens are females. I don't know how many of you are into genetics, but the, comp the genetic composition of a drone is a single set of chromosomes, not a double set like humans have and queens have and female bees have. It's a single set of, their only function is to mate with a queen. The only way the hive tolerates their existence is so that they're available to mate with a queen. In October, the drones get kicked out on their butt and they die because the hive sees no reason to feed them over the winter. <laughs> yeah, they've done their job. Uh, yes. <laughs> if you're a drone in October, you're out of there. <laughs> and they'll make new drones from unfertilized eggs for next year. And they'll be around waiting to see if they need to wait with the queen. But if they don't, they're out of there. <laughs> Bees don't waste anything. They're very efficient critters. <laughs> okay, I have, I have gone all over the place. I'm so, all, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Beekeeping regulations in the state of Tennessee. You cannot be denied the ability to, to have a hive of bees in the state of Tennessee. If you live in an apartment complex and you want a beehive, you can have it. Now, you probably need to have a balcony because I don't know that I'd want to have one indoors. <laughs> but if you live in the state of Tennessee, you can have a beehive. Nobody can tell you no. Your neighbors might not be pleased, but there's really no danger in having a beehive. Those bees are not going to bother anyone with one caveat. When we got bees, my husband ate a banana every morning. And then he'd walk past the beehive. Every morning, the bees would come out and try to sting him. I came to find out later that banana has the same pheromone as the attack pheromone in bees. And it took me two or three days, but I eventually told him. <laughs> <laughs> if you plan on visiting an apiary, if you plan on going by bees, 
don't eat a banana. <laughs> it's the same chemical. <laughs> In the same context, if you plan on, if you know that there's a, a ground bee, you know, a yellow jacket or a, a something, don't wear perfume and then be surprised. <laughs> they think you're a flower, guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, I taught for 35 years. Yes, ma'am. And ma I think beehives next to school would not be appropriate because so many children have allergic reactions yeah. that are dangerous to these things. Yeah, but that bee's going to fly, fly for two, uh, two miles. Okay. The range of the average honeybee is two miles. Um, and bees don't bother you unless you're swatting at them. Or well, and what little child would know, you know? Well, if I had one next to a school, I think I'd be telling them, you know, how to deal with a bee. Like, if you get a bee on your arm, don't swat at it. Blow it. It'll flow out, fly away. Just, it won't sting. It, it, but if you swat it and kill it, then it's just released an attack pheromone, and any other bee in the area is coming for you. Wow. So blow it. It'll go away. Any bee? <laughs> uh, I find it's most successful with any bee. Uh, there's a thing on the Internet, and I'm not recommending the Internet for information. Uh, I mean, not like Facebook. But there's a little thing on the Internet. The different bees, uh, most of them don't sting. Like the little, the carpenter bee that gets in your face, that's an aggressive move. They don't have the capability to sting you. Uh, the female of the species can bite you, but the male can't, can't do a thing. So that carpenter bee that you're like, ah, because it's big and it's scary and it's very aggressive, it's aggressive because it doesn't have any other way <laughs> to, get, yeah, to, <laughs> to get you away. <laughs> so, um, the kind of equipment that a beekeeper uses is called, a, typically, the boxes you see in fields as you drive by, it's called a Langstroth hive. It's a box. It's got a little ridge in the inside, and these, these, these frames hang inside. You dump the bees in, they pull out, they, they manufacture the wax, and then they use these, the wax is always in these hexagon forms, these little shapes, and then they, they're slightly inclined so that if it does get water in there, the water won't collect and, and in, in there because it'll kill the larva or the pupa or the egg. Um, and then you got 10 of these in a standard deep hive. You got 10 of these puppies. It's heavy. If you want to start with bees, I don't think I can lift them anymore. It's, that's my recommendation. That's, this is a personal recommendation. There's no scientific basis for this. When you pick up a Langstroth hive with 10 of these puppies in it full of bees and wax, it's heavy. You're looking at it between 80 and 100 pounds. So I, there are variations that are smaller. I'd go with a smaller one. There's an eight frame version. There's a short, short box. Um, you just have to investigate the different kinds that you're willing to deal with. There's also something called a top bar hive, which is shaped like a, like a watering trough on legs. And you just have strips of wood across the top. The bees make their hive, uh, pull the wax, draw the wax out, attach to these little bar, the little pieces of wood that go across the top. And then when you take those out, it's, you just, you take it out gently like this, and the, and the comb is just, it's naturally done. This comb was drawn out from an imprinted sheet of wax. There was a piece of wax in here that had the imprint of this on it, and then the bees did it themselves. But they, so they didn't start from nothing. In a top bar hive, they start from nothing. They, have you ever seen a uh, beehive in nature? It, it's just sheets of wax hanging down like this. Like a tree. They're, they like cavities, but if it, once they run out of room in the cavity, they'll, you can see, yeah. And you can see, I saw one in the top of a tree once. It, it was like, it was a pecan tree, and it was easily 100 foot tall. And, the, and, the, and it was up there, and I just thought, what is that? And it was these bees moving over the surface of the wax, and it was one of the prettiest things I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. It's cool looking. And then there's other modified top bar hive, Langstroth hive. When you start looking at your equipment, you'll see there's a plethora of equipment. So you just pick which is most convenient for you. But I wouldn't, I don't know. If I was, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, when I get bees again, I'm going to get rid of the, all the deep hives and go to a medium. I just can't lift it anymore. And when you drop a hive, they're not happy. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no. <laughs> well, typically I wear this. This is part of your equipment. Uh, there's different versions. Again, please let me emphasize that when you talk to 10 different beekeepers, you get 10 different recommendations. You get 10 different answers. So when you talk to people, just keep that in mind. But when I go out to the beehives, I'm wearing this. Unless I'm just looking in for a second, and then I have been known not to wear anything. I, you can tell if they're angry or not. You can tell if they're like, once you get accustomed to it, you can tell. There's a difference in the no noise that they make. When they're happy, la, 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 it's bzzz. When they're unhappy, it's bzzz. The whole thing, yeah, you, you can tell. But this is what you wear. You usually, you want to wear all white because bees don't like black. There are no goth beekeepers. And then uh, you just tie it around so you, you prevent them from getting in. You usually secure your pants so they can't get in the bottom of that. But I just wear a white shirt, white pants. They have full suits. Beekeep a lot of the beekeepers wear full, full suits. Some beekeepers, but again, some pe beekeepers wear nothing and, and do a good job of it. So, yeah, that's just another of the variations. You want to put your beehive in the full sun. Uh, we'll cover pests in a minute, but one of the things that is indicated is that small hive beetle, beetle doesn't like full sun. It, it prefers shade, something a little cooler. And one of the reasons for colony collapse, it, they think, is the presence of the small hive beetle and an overwhelming presence to the point where the bees don't want to live there anymore. They're tired, tired of fooling. Small hive beetle was introduced into the United States by accident. Uh, back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. And that's, that's one of the problems that are facing bees right now. It's just a little bitty, it's a little bitty black beetle. It loves to live and eat the honey. It loves to live in the hive. And then it, bur it heads out, it's got wings, burrows out, goes into the ground, uh, lays eggs, turns into larvae, hatches, comes back up and reinfects the hive. Mm. So you, the, the health of the hive it, that's one of the indications that the hive is possibly not healthy is because you'll see an overabundance of the uh, hive beetle. Um, Where did it come from? We think. I don't know. And the bees I'm, can't kill it like they would extra queens? No. Mm -hmm. They just run it off. And they try to run it off. When you say full sun, does that mean like out in an open field where it is constant sun? Yes. But again, you ask 10 different beekeepers you get 10 different answers but most of them prefer air circulation full sun um, away from large pests pests are, include mice they include skunks they include raccoons they include bears if in and, and I don't know about if we have any bears around here I'm sure there's some in East Ten I know there's some in East Tennessee but any any area that has bears they have to protect their bees somehow from the bears, because the bears will rip the hive apart. Um, also, high, uh, pests that get into the hives are your small hive beetle. Uh, there's a mite that gets into your bees. Um, that's called, there's a tracheal mite that gets into the trachea that causes a decline in health. There's a varroa mite that attaches itself to the body of the bee and kind of sucks, it, sucks its blood. That's another, um, and those two mites, and the hive beetles and uh, a disease called nosema are contributing factors to the health of the bees. The less healthy the bee is, the more likely it is to take off and disappear or die. You can also have a colony that just flat out dies. Colonies can, can die from starvation. They can die from cold. Uh, they can die from chalk brood. They can die from European fowl brood. They can uh, die from American fowl brood. Fowl brood, chalk brood are, are viruses that attack the beehive. You can tell it looks, when ch the hive frames look chalky when you see um, that disease. The fowl brood diseases, both the European and the American, look sticky and they stink. They, it, it's, like the, it's, like, it's like it got dissolved. Another pest of it is the wax moth. Now, it's 
not one thing that kills it is, well, the foul broods will kill it. But it's not just one thing, it's the combination of the things that either cause colony collapse or cause the death of the hive altogether. So if you have ample food, because um, a lot of beekeepers feed their bees over the winter, uh, the bees won't die. Bees will, when a bee collects sugar water, and here I am digressing again, but when a bee <laughs> collects sugar water, it will pass it from one to the other until it gets to the queen in the center of the hive. Uh, the bee, in the wintertime, the bees uh, drop their numbers. They form a ball in the center of the hive. They want to maintain a temperature of 95 degrees. The ones on the outside will go get a, uh, water or... And they don't need it unless it gets warm outside. If it gets warm, they need a little bit of sugar water. They need a little bit of water. They'll come and collect that and then pass it through. And they rotate in and out. But the queen is always protected. And then next spring, they'll start driving their numbers up again. Uh, to collect honey, the honey flow in this area is typically May the 5th. That's when you see the abundance of nectar and flowers start to appear. Um, now, you may not see a huge amount of flowers on May the 5th, but the trees are doing tons of flower production in the tops that you're not aware of. So... It, there's st every green plant flowers. If it's a green plant, it flowers. And if it's flowering, the bees are collecting honey and nectar from it. Or not honey and nectar, nectar and pollen from it, excuse me. Hmm. Clean water should be available within a one quarter mile radius. I usually just put some water next to it. When I had bees, before I lost them all, <laughs> I would put water right next to them. <laughs> okay, the queen of everything. The queen. The queen. She lays eggs. That's all she does. She mates. She kills her mates. Then she, she lays eggs. She doesn't kill them intentionally. She rips their bodies apart when she's done mating with them. They don't, list, they don't let, uh, last past that. <laughs> the workers. Young workers tend to the inside of the hive. They try to drive the uh, beetles off. They clean up the little spaces when the, when the bees hatch. Um, they feed the larva. They feed the eggs. Up till the three day mark, if your queen is dead and you have an egg that's less than three days old and those workers decide to feed her royal jelly, she's going to become a queen or a potential queen. Um, they make wax and propolis. Propolis seals everything up. They want a secure space so nothing else can get in there and, and attack them or kill them or rob their honey like me. I'm in there robbing their honey. But this propolis stuff, it's sticky, gets on everything. You've got to break it apart with a tool. Um, and they will seal this into the hive. You're going to have to pry this out of the hive. Um, they'll try to seal up everything on earth. Um, but that's pro propolis. It's just a different kind of wax. Um, then they defend the nest. There's other bees that are going to try to get in there and get their honey too. Bees that smell that honey are coming after it. So they're the defenders. Then after they're three weeks old, they're out in the fields gathering uh, nectar and pollen and bringing it back to the nest. Nectar's used to make honey. Um, it takes like 10,000 trips to make one teaspoon. And um, then the pollen is used as a food source, source of protein. Uh, drones mate with the queen. Then they die. So I tried to get people to come with me that, to wear the drone shirt, but none of my male beekeeping companions were willing to do it. I was going to wear a little queen hat. <laughs> they're, they're, they're just not. <laughs> Three days, your egg is, gonna be, is designated to be a worker, a drone, or a queen. Well, the drone's a matter of genetics. Nobody, n nothing's going to change there. Three days, it's going to be a worker. And then it's going to change. At six days, it's, it's in the larval stage. For the queen, it'd be 5.5. 12 days, the worker is uh, a pupa. For the queen, it's 7.5. Remember, it's getting a better quality of food, so it's growing faster. Total days, egg to adult, worker 21, drone 24, queen 16. She's going fast, which is why if you 
you, you got to get in and check your hives. You got to get in and check your, your frames. When you go in there, you need to go in every once to two weeks, you know, one week to two weeks. You can't just, well, you could just let it go and let nature take its course, but it's recommended one to two weeks you check those frames. And you want to go in one by one. Do I have eggs? Do I have pupa? Do I see any evidence of disease? Do I, can I find my queen? Eight years, I have never found my queen. <laughs> the queen is bigger. She's one and a half times bigger than the average bee. The drone is bigger than the average bee, so they're, they're a little bit easier to spot, but they're bigger and they're much more numerous. Uh, and a queen, if you get a, a commercially produced queen, they will take and put a little dot of, shoe nail, uh, of fingernail polish on her back. And each year is a different color, and it rotates five-year increments. So it'll be, you know that this year is green. I don't really know what this year is. But green, white, red, blue. And you look for the, the one with the dot. A lot of people can pick out a queen without any uh, help from the shoe, pol the shoe uh, fingernail polish industry. Queens are one and a half times the size of the rest of the bees. Drones are bigger also. I don't know why drones are bigger. But when you see a drone cell, it looks like a little bullet sticking out. This is probably dehydrated, so I don't, so if there were any, I don't, they probably sucked back in. But it, it would stick out. See, these are all flat cells, but it would stick out. Colonies, that you want a colony that's going to produce 100 pounds of extra honey. That's, and, and how you figure that out is by the genetics of your bees. Honey, uh, Italian bees are great producers. They're gentle bees, so they're easy to work with. But in the same frame, they let other bees come in, and, and it, they're not as good as killing your, your hive beetles. They're not as good at running off other bees that are coming in to, to uh, steal their honey. So, you know, you just got to evaluate which species or, or which genetics you're looking for. Um, 40 to 60 pounds of, of honey needs to be in the hive to get your bees through the winter. So 40 to 60 pounds of honey just to get them through the winter and then another 100 for you to, to uh, pull it off. Increases in bee population in the spring are designed by nature to coincide with the uptick in the honey flow. And when I say honey flow, I mean flowers uh, starting to bloom and produce nectar. Races of bees, honeybees, not native to the United States is the Italian honeybees. The Carniolans, it's a variety of uh, Italian bee. They're not as pretty as the other ones. They're more gray and black than the standard yellow and, and black. And then the Caucasian honeybee, which is, I don't believe I've ever seen one. Where are they from? Uh, most of them are from the Middle East. Okay. Now, the Africanized honeybee um, is from Africa. And it has been found in the southern part of this continent, or in South America and then in Central America. But as the Africanized honeybee moves further north, it's losing its aggressiveness because it's mating with the standard honeybee that we're used to, which is the uh, European honeybee. So those genetic traits are being diluted. There may be, oh, I'll get, I'll shut up for just a second, I'll get back to that. Uh, Starline hybrid is not available. Italian Cordovans, Carniolan hybrids, Russian bee. Russian bee is more aggressive. It's a good bee, produces a good crop of honey, but it's more aggressive. That's the one that went after my husband every day. <laughs> <laughs> the hygienic bee is supposed to be better at grooming. The varroa mite attaches to the bee, it sucks its little blood. The hygienic bee is much better at getting that thing off. If it gets it off, it's more resistant to disease because, and it has more vigor, because it's not supporting this little parasite. Um, so that's the varroa thing. Colony standard. Bee population. 8 to 16 brood frames from April 10th to 21. This is a brood frame. Worker bees, 60,000 to 100,000 bees. 
Drones, a thousand or greater, appear in March, disappear in October, and we, we already know why they disappear. Disposition. Italians are sweet. Russians are mean. <laughs> Low level of swarm. <laughs> Low level of swarming. Now, let's, let's reintroduce. When it comes to swarming and colony collapse, let's reintroduce the idea of the Africanized bee genetics. I have no scientific proof for this, this, what I'm about to say, but I did listen to a, a very experienced beekeeper say that he thinks there may be some reason for swarming and colony collapse because of the introduction of the Africanized bee genetics. The reason for that is in the uh, European honeybee, when they sense danger or sense aggression, what they do is they eat a bunch of honey and they sit real tight waiting. Like we can, we can, we, we, we'll last this. We'll just, we'll just hide until whatever this is go, goes away. The Africanized honeybee eats a bunch of honey and leaves. So there's 40% of our honeybees in this country have some form of African genetics. So that may be where that, that behavior trait is coming from. They suck up as much honey as they can and they're out of town. They're going someplace else because this isn't a good place to live. And I have had people say to me, well, can't you lock them up? <laughs> well, no. <laughs> I really can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mite resistance. Again, we've got the tracheal mite, which we can't scratch that one off. But if, if we get a bee that's really good about getting that varroa mite off, and you can see if you put powdered sugar in your hive uh, and the bees will uh, do their little hygiene thing and they'll, they'll get it off. And then you look in the bottom, you can see a bunch of tracheomites or uh, varroa mites. That you, just like a scientific grid, you just put a grid underneath there and then you can count them. Okay, 10, 20, 30. And at a certain point, we're in, we're in trouble. <laughs> Honey production, 100 pounds plus the 40 to 60 pounds that the bees use. Equipment, okay. Um, I screwed up. I didn't bring as much as I should have. But you have gloves or not. You have veils or not. Helmets. This is a helmet. Uh, you have clothing, full body suits or not. Um, hive smokers and tools. The smoker is an indication to the bee that there's a forest fire in the area. They do that little thing where they suck up as much honey as they can and they sit real tight. And that allows you to get into the hive and look at the condition that the hive is in. It causes them to go, okay, I, I'm waiting. Yeah, you are actually traumatizing them. Yeah. Better them than me. <laughs> <laughs> when you're working with a, a colony and you're going in, you have your equipment. There's a cover. There's an inner cover. There's a box. The box has all the frames in it. You light your smoker, and you have a little bellows on the back, and you poof, 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 and you do it around the hive, and they, they do this. And then you take off the cover and you go in and you start prying these puppies out of there and you want to see, I want to see my eggs. This is a typical brood pattern and this is a good brood pattern. I want to see my eggs. Um, I want to see my larva. I want to see that the larva is clear and healthy looking, not gray or ish. Um, and I want to see that there's a band of honey across the top here. And I want to make sure that everything's good. Then I put that back in. I go on to the next one and the next one and the next one. Um, don't leave the colony open for too long. They don't like that. And then the sound of the bee will vary depending upon their mood. Bzzz, la, la, la. To zzz, And then you know you're in trouble. Weekly or a bi-weekly inspection of the hive is best. Um... But, you, you know, you can, I've talked to people that had excellent beehives. They hadn't opened them in a year. I don't, I don't know. I expect the brood frames. Larvae should be pearly white, gray, yellow, brown, or black. Larvae are diseased, and there's a pattern. Like this. This is, well, actually, this is a better pattern. This is a nice pattern. I told you how to install a package of bees. You collect a swarm. Swarms will not sting you. If you see a swarm on your fence, you do not need to be alarmed. Um, 
those bees are solely existing there to protect their queen and they're looking for a new home. They're sending out um, scouts to find a good place to live. They're, they're not interested in doing any harm to you or anything in your yard. So if you don't want them, just call the Rutherford County Beekeeping Association or call the Ag, call the extension down there on, on uh, and they'll send somebody to come and get them. And they will come and get them. Um, collecting a swarm, since they won't sting you, if they're on a branch, you can just cut the branch and drop it in a box, uh, a frame box with frames, or just a cardboard box. Uh, and, until you can get it with frames. Again, it's a swarm. It's not going to sting you. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. If you, get, if you can find the queen and put her in the box, you can just put the box next to the swarm and the rest of them will walk in. Because they, all they want is that queen. That's their queen. She's the queen of everything. <laughs> and it's really pretty cool. That's how I first got interested in bees was by looking at a swarm one. Wow. <laughs> that's that's pretty neat. Yeah. Um, you can move a colony a short distance, like two foot. If you move it more than that, the bees that left don't know where to come back. They do do a little dance where they tell the other bees where to go, but you got to leave it in the same spot. Either move it two foot or two miles. If you intend to move it over time, you can always put it on a wagon, leave it in the same spot for a day, move it two foot. Next day, move it two foot. Next day, move it two foot. Till you, get it, till you get it to where you want it to be, you know, in its new location, and then you're fine. Uh, bees have to be vent. Well, there's a lot of discussion. Do you have air circulation for your bees or not? Some people have solid boards. This is an equipment question. Um, other people say the bees just take care of it themselves, leave it alone. And uh, you, you move a colony when... It just depends. Say you got a bunch of skunks moved in next door. You move the skunks, you move the bees. I don't know. <laughs> That's a question for y'all. Uh, <laughs> you prepare the colony by not taking too much honey for the winter. You prepare a colony for the winter by not taking too much honey. You make sure that they're healthy. They're going to form a ball, and, and you can take the extra hives off. You want as much space, uh, as little space, for those bees to keep warm as possible. Remember, they want that queen to be 95 degrees in there. So if you give them this much space, they, they'll, they'll die trying to heat the whole thing. Because it's just a ball now. They've gotten rid of all those extra bees. It's just a ball and the queen in the middle. So uh, bring down your boxes. Take the extra boxes off. Just leave them enough honey to get through the winter. And uh, don't open. Don't be inspecting that beehive unless it's uh, a minimum of 55. 65 is better. You don't want to inspect your inside of your beehive when it's windy, if it's a windy cold day. If it's a windy warm day, that's fine. You don't want to inspect your beehive when it's cloudy. They don't like it. They like sunshine. Um, and just, you just learn and you, you, you do what's best for the bees to keep them happy. The pests of honeybees, we've already gone over that. Wax moth, they'll, they'll run away like a wildfire. Wax moth will destroy your wax, too. It just, you won't be able to use it again. It's just nasty. The other ones, the uh, foul brood and the um, European foul brood, if you get those, you, have, you should report it. You should. You have to report it to the um, state apiarist so that they know that that disease has appeared in your area and then typically you'll have to destroy your frames and either destroy your boxes or sterilize them with like a, a, a little torch, a acetylene torch to kill any of the virus. Most people just destroy the boxes and boxes are expensive. This is the most expensive hobby I have ever had. <laughs> Thirty percent of all beehives are lost every year. So the next time you go to the store and you're not happy about paying $9 for that one pound container of bee of honey. Um, and if you would be so kind as to buy local honey, it'd be great. We're getting a lot of honey in from uh, China. And some of it's like high fructose corn syrup with a little bit of honey. So when you see really cheap honey, 
it's not honey. It, it may have a little bit of honey in it, but please, local beekeepers rely on, on y'all. Uh, majority of the bees leave the hive abandoning, oh, that, that's the colony collapse. Majority, they, leave, they just disappear. They leave the eggs, they leave the larva, they leave the queen, and they're gone. I, if I knew why, I'd be, a, I'd be a much better beekeeper, and I'd, I'd probably have more money. <laughs> um, the hive in a colony collapse disorder will not be able to survive. Actually, this one came from colony collapse. This was a full frame of larva, honey, eggs, and one day they just disappeared. And that's the end. Thank you for listening to me. Oh, thank I you. <laughs>